Shalom and welcome to the weekend edition of the Daily Dose of Hebrew. Today we're looking at Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 13. And in the last couple of verses, Jeremiah has been extolling the greatness of the God of Israel in comparison with the uh, the gods of the other nations that he has, he has decried uh, a couple of verses earlier. Uh, a couple interesting things with this verse. It's going to be a little bit tricky. Let's go ahead and read it in Hebrew as we get started. Le kol tito hamon mayim b'shemayim ve'ya'ale nesi'im mitze aretz barakim lematar asa ve'yotze ruak me'otzrotav now, one of the trickiest things we have is this, uh, these first two words here. Um, we can analyze them pretty easily. This is just our preposition, lameth, uh, attached to kol, so it's to, uh, for the voice or for the sound. Let's take it as voice here. For a voice, and, and then we have tito. Well, again, um, a little unusual, but we, we should be able to analyze this. This is tit here. This is the, um, tit is the uh, infinitive construct uh, cal of the verb natan. So it's something that uh, we're fairly used to seeing. Natan. And in this case here, um, it's, an, it's an unusual uh, infinitive construct in, in its form because it's just a, a double tau here. And in this case, it has a suffix, a 3ms suffix. So it's his giving. So he, usually we're, we're familiar with an expression that goes more like um, giving the voice. Um, and uh, it, it's hard to know how best to translate this, and it's caused the problems for the commentators, because literally it says, for the voice of his giving, or, or perhaps uh, the lament is being used in a uh, sort of a temporal sort of a way, when the voice he gives. So should we translate this, when he gives his voice? The usual expression would actually be more uh, like, um, it'd be more like this, when and put the infinitive construct here, when he gives, and then you'd find coal over here, like this, with like with a, a pronoun suffix, when he gives uh, his voice, you might find something like that, but that's not what we have here. Uh, and some propositions are, are you know, made to maybe we should read this kind of a thing instead of what we have here. This is a little bit unusual. Um, so there's a, quite a discussion on it in some of the commentaries, like McCain's commentary in the ICC. Uh, the great uh, medieval uh, Jewish commentator Rashi says, yes, it would be more common to have la, la tito like that, uh, followed by kol. Uh, but he says this is perfectly understandable. It doesn't seem to bother him. Interestingly, the Septuagint doesn't seem to have translated this, these two words here at all. They just kind of jump into uh, the abundance of waters over here, the, the, uh, the noise of the waters that's going over. So um, a little bit interesting. We'll see what, what uh, some of the translations do with this a little bit later. But so a little bit of an unusual thing right there. And then we have hamon, which is a word which usually means the, the roar or the sound or rumbling of something like that. So we have the sound or the rumbling of waters, mayim, so this is in construct state with waters, in the, so we have preposition and the article here, in the heavens. So we might want to translate that um, when his giving voice, um, and then this would be more like a nominal phrase, that's a phrase with, without the verb, uh, without an expressly, um, without an express verb in it, uh, there is, we might want to say, there is um, a roar of water in the heavens. So this would be referring probably to, to, to thunder when God uh, brings a storm. There's a roar of water in the heavens. Um, now what do we have here? And we have, a, here we're going to have an imperfect. Let's see, and it's going to be an imperfect consecutive. You have a yod at the beginning, nothing at the end. So this is going to be a 3ms uh, from the verb Allah. But uh, with, well, we're used to seeing these patheks here, but here, especially with the, with the segol underneath it, and in the context, we're going to see this is actually going to be not a cow from Allah, but a hifil. So it's not uh, he, w uh, he, he went up, but he caused to go up. Uh, that's what we have. And what is he causing to go up? Nasi'im. This is a word that's, um, it means the mist. M-I-S-T, or clouds that are being formed. It's, uh, it's almost always used in the plural form. So he causes to go up mists or clouds 
uh, but clouds that are being formed in order to give rain. You can just see a storm that's developing there like a thunderhead. He causes the mist to go up from the end of audits. Now, you see, well, this is a little unusual. Um, usually we have edits like this. This is actually a caricative. Uh, what we have in, in the written form is, is usually just with the, the double uh, segol edits, but we also have an athnak under here. So this is the midpoint of the verse, which tends to lengthen this vowel a little bit. But usually when you have the article, and we don't have the article here, the kare form actually puts in another comment here to, to let you know that the, uh, the Masoretes... Uh, would prefer to read this as ha audits instead of just edits. So this would be f from the end of the earth because it would be in construct state here. So again, a little variation here with the caricative reading and uh, you, you'll see that show up. Barakim, here's a plural of barak, which is a word you may know in the context of storms and heavens and, and rain and everything else. This is a word which means lightning and here it's obviously plural. So lightnings, lightnings for the rain, the mata is the word for rain, and there's our article there. Lightnings for the rain he makes, uh, or actually a, a perfect over here, uh, which is the equivalent of the imperfect consecutive over here, he makes. So this is things that God does, and uh, this is an imperfect consecutive, and with the perfect showing these are the way that God, these are the ways that God usually acts. These are the things that he does. And uh, so he makes lightnings for the rain, and he brings forth, once again, we have an imperfect consecutive, 3ms, hifio from the verb yatsa, which means to go out. So in the hifio means to, to bring out. So he brings out, in this context, wind, because we're talking about all these phenomena of, of the storm here. Wind from, and then otsar. Otsar is a word... Uh, we used to sing it sometimes with a fully written vav, a uh, holem vav right here. And th in this case, the uh, the other vav isn't written either because it's otsarot. It's masculine, even though it takes sort of a feminine, it takes this feminine ending. And we have a pronoun suffix at the end. It's just three mess. So otsar is a word which means storehouses, a storehouse or treasury. Here it's plural. So it's treasuries or storehouses and with the, with the suffix from his storehouses. So God brings forth the winds and all of these other uh, meteorological phenomena from his storehouses. So you can see what uh, what the whole force of the verb is, that God is the one who, who controls, has absolute control over the weather. That's a good thing for us to remember today with all the debates going on. Well, let's go ahead and hide our work here and take a look at a couple of translations. It's sort of interesting. So uh, let's take, first of all, the ESV, which is probably going to be the most literal. When he utters his voice. So that uh, when in the temporal sense with the Lama here, when the, he gives uh, Tito, when his giving the voice. So they've just kind of smoothed that out. Like like Rashi said, uh, it doesn't matter whether you put it this way or invert it. It's still going to have the, main, the same sense. When he utters his voice, there is a tumult, a tumult of waters in the heavens. So there is is not directly in the text but as i said it's a nominal proposition here tumult of waters in the heavens and he makes the mist rise to cause to rise from the ends of the earth so they have the the here reading with the with the cray reading he makes lightning for the rain and he brings forth the wind from his storehouses the rest is pretty straightforward now a little bit different is the Dwayne rames version this is a catholic version um basically from the Vulgate, but going back and looking at the Hebrew. At his voice, he giveth a multitude of waters in the heavens. Now, they've done something a little, a little bit different. He giveth a multitude. So what they've done here, uh, at his voice, and they must be reading at the giving of his voice. Um, well, actually, uh, at the voice, I don't think they've actually put the he in there, uh, his. They've kind of assumed that that's there. He giveth his giving the multitudes. So they've made hamon, multitude of waters. They've made this sort of the direct object of the infinitive, uh, the infinitive construct over here. Now, most of our translators uh, have not gone in that direction. They think that's really getting a little bit awkward to do there. Um, it's, it's a possibility, uh, probably not the best. I don't see any problem with understanding it like the ESV does, but they, they made this uh, a direct object. Uh, Kyle and Delich, I think, have a, a commentary on that, why, he, why don't, they don't agree with making it the direct object. But it doesn't change a whole lot in the sense, does it? So, uh, waters in the heaven and lifteth up the clouds from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings for rain 
and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasure out of his treasures. And then one more, which is also a little bit different, um, the New English Bible from over in England, at the thunder of his voice, okay, the water that, that's picking up this. They didn't do too much with that. Uh, the well, actually, uh, they, they may have a little bit. The, the the waters in heaven are amazed. Well, what what they've done over here? They they trying to take this word. They've re rewritten some of this, and uh, they've made this word over here into the verb. T- instead of hama hamon, they've written this somehow as uh, tama is the verb to be amazed and just kind of move some of these consonants around to try and make better sense out of it. I don't see any um, uh, manuscript justification for any of these and this is this is quite a proposition uh, that they've made there. Um, the water in heaven are amazed. I, I don't see how you can get that out of that. He brings up the mist uh, from the ends of the earth. He opens rifts for the rain. And so instead of um, barak here for lightnings, they've read badak, making this a dalith here, which is a, a word which means a rift or a separation. So but again, there's no manuscript evidence for that, but uh, it, it would be a common mistake. So he, he made, um, opens rifts for the rain, but I don't see any problem with lightnings. So I don't see why you need rifts to do that, and brings the wind out of his storehouses. Interestingly, in the REB, the Revised English Bible, which is a revision of the NEB, they've they've abandoned this, this translation over here and gone back to something like the other translations. They did keep rifts for that second part of it, but they did abandon that first part. In any case, we see that uh, this is the God who controls all uh, all of nature, and he controls the most massive things that we are aware of, which are his storms that affect us here on the earth. And this is the God that Jeremiah wants to call our attention to, and uh, he wants to bring all the nations in, in awareness of this. Very great and, and awesome verse. We'll check back with us soon as we continue working through uh, chapter 10 in the weekend edition of the Daily News of Hebrew. Shalom.